In this latter part of chapter 19, we're going to be paying special attention to enzymes that are capable of degrading DNA and RNA. That is, these are nucleases, and aptly named because they do break down or hydrolyze nucleic acids. Now, these nucleases vary quite a lot. Some of them are specific for DNA, some of them are specific for RNA, right? And some of them have roles that they play in repair, um, and others in just in degradation. They're functionally specific. So um, I have a model here, our good old model of DNA. Um, so some of these nucleases will chew from the ends. So for example, some of them will chew down from the 5' prime end, gobbling that way. Others will chew from the 3' prime end, gobbling that way. There are a lot of 3' prime specific exonucleases that will just chew that way. I think of those as being kind of like the Pac-Man enzymes that will chew from one end. End. There are others that can cut in the middle so that are able to come into a strand and literally excise or I shouldn't say excise, they cut, they literally cut in the middle of the strand. So we have two different names for these two different types of nucleases. These are the exonucleases that chew this way and the endonucleases that are more like scissors, so our Pac-Mans versus our scissor enzymes. Um, so scissor enzymes kind of cutting in the middle, endonucleases and these are exonucleases. So let's write that down and just differentiate. Nucleases, of course, as a whole, cleave phosphodiester bonds, um, and we'll look in a moment at how they can cleave in either the, at the, either the five prime or the three prime phosphodiester linkage. And the two types that we talked about, there are either exonucleases that hydrolyze from the ends, so chewing from the ends only, and then there are the endonucleases that are more like the scissors that can cut in the middle. So they catalyze hydrolysis at various sites within a polynucleotide chain. And in fact, those endonucleases, as we're going to see very soon, can be very, very specific. And this is where this topic becomes so fascinating because as it turns out, we can get specific restriction enzymes, enzymes that are specific unique endonucleases that cut at unique places. And from that pattern of cutting, we can actually literally get uh, uh, a very unique uh, DNA gel that we can run, that we can map. It's literally called a map that we can see the difference between individual people. That is, it's kind of like a fingerprint. And so if we are able to cut people's DNA in unique places and look at the pattern that results from that, we're able to identify people that way. So at a crime scene investigation, for example, we might be able to determine who was the perpetrator based upon the pattern of cutting in their DNA. So this has a huge role in forensic science and makes this a really super trendy and exciting topic. So what we see then is the the um, 5 prime, 3 prime phosphodiester bond, um, but the cleavage is going to have to occur either here at the 3 prime phosphoester or it will occur here at the 5 prime phosphoester. Notice why it gets that name, right? Here's our 3 prime hydroxyl, the ester linkage closest to that is going to be termed the 3 prime phosphoester. The one that's closest to the 5 prime carbon um, is going to be termed the 5 prime phosphoester. So there will be cleavage at either one of those two. Now this will cause a difference in what products are going to be formed, right? We could get either a situation here, and if we look at this, uh, this particular example, uh, what we see here is that we have an adenine base, so we have a deoxyadenosine nucleoside, and um, in this case, if the cleavage occurs at the 3' prime phosphoester bond, you're basically going to end up with a cleavage product that is just Pa, right? Um, so we have the, it's an adenylate residue, or if you will, um, uh, a, the phosphoryl group here goes along with the deoxyadenosine nucleoside, and then plus PG, right? Because the phosphoryl group, if the cleavage occurs here, goes with the, the guanylate residue. So it, uh, likewise, if we could look then at the 5' prime phosphoester bond, if cleavage occurred here, we would see then that the phosphoryl group would go along with the um, adenylate. So you would basically see then PAP. 
plus G. So there is a big difference as to whether it cleaves at the 3 prime phosphoester bond or the 5, five prime phosphoester bond in terms of which residue that phosphoryl group will go with. Okay, cool. So to begin our first discussion of hydrolysis, I want to begin with a question. Why is DNA and not RNA the primary genetic material? What's crazy about this is that this dirty kitchen chemistry is possible because we are working with DNA. So when we work with DNA rather than with RNA, DNA is exceedingly stable. Uh, that's why it's the molecule of life, because it is so stable. And remember that the main difference between DNA and RNA is that little hydroxyl at the two prime carbon. The two prime carbon without a hydroxyl is not reactive. However, in RNA with that two prime hydroxyl, it's extremely reactive. Put in even like a 0.1 normal solution of sodium hydroxide and you've got a problem that RNA is gonna degrade itself. We couldn't do anything like this kitchen chemistry that we're doing with RNA. RNA would get degraded right away. So DNA, highly stable molecule. RNA, highly reactive. That little two prime hydroxyl really make all that much difference difference? Absolutely. <laughs> because in fact that nothing demonstrates that more than looking at what happens to RNA when it is placed in a very weak solution of base, sodium hydroxide to be exact. And after just a very short period of time in that sodium hydroxide, RNA becomes degraded. DNA will remain stable for hours, um, in fact for much longer than that. So RNA RNA is very subject to degradation because of that 2 prime hydroxyl group. Let's look at what role that plays in this reaction mechanism. So we picture the base providing hydroxide, free hydroxide anion, right? And that anion can react in a sort of acid base way. Um, and in fact, so can the 2 prime hydroxyl of RNA. So what happens is that the hydroxide ion abstracts a proton from the 2 prime hydroxyl. So it actually gives up its proton, forming a water molecule and forming a very strong nucleophile in the 2 prime location that quite simply just immediately attacks the linking phosphorus atom and breaks the linkage between the two nucleotides of the RNA. So the resulting nucleophile attacks the phosphorus atom, displacing the 5 prime oxygen and generating an unstable 2 prime, 3 prime cyclic nucleoside monophosphate because of course once that 2 prime hydroxyl has attacked the phosphorus atom, it becomes linked to that phosphorus atom as well. And of, But of course the 5 prime um, phosphoester bond has been broken. So let's, we're going to look at a picture of this in just a moment, but let's just write down the last step here. Uh, attack by then another hydroxide anion catalyzes the conversion of this 2,3 cyclic nucleoside monophosphate intermediate, very unstable. It will catalyze the conversion of that molecule to either the 2 prime or the 3 prime nucleoside monophosphate. Here's a picture that says a thousand words. Here's our hydroxyl anion, the hydroxyl anion abstracting a proton from that 2 prime hydroxyl. Okay, DNA would be stable throughout this process because it only has a hydrogen there, right? But RNA very reactive here, um, the proton abstracted generates a very strong nucleophile. The nucleophile attacks the linking phosphorus atom. The, the five prime phosphoester bond is broken and the resulting product is going to be bound to both the two prime and three prime oxygens, giving us that unstable cyclic structure, cyclic nucleoside monophosphate, very unstable in the presence of base. Uh, the, in fact, uh, another hydroxide anion attacks the phosphorus um, electrophile file and this forms what would either be 50-50 chance of either a 2 prime monophosphate or a 3 prime monophosphate. Um, you know, either one will form. And so there we have it, um, RNA extremely subject to breakdown, to degradation, um, to alkaline hydrolysis. Um, it won't last long in a very weak solution of base. <laughs>
So an alkaline solution is by far not the only substance that can lead to the hydrolysis of RNA. Um, and in fact, in our environment are many pesky enzymes, um, sometimes pesky, right? They, they are there for a purpose, but when you're working within, within the lab, they can sometimes seem fairly pesky because they degrade, very readily degrade RNA. So one of those enzymes is called bovine pancreatic ribonuclease A. For short, it is most often referred to as RNAase A is a fairly small enzyme, actually 124 amino acid residues. It contains a large number of disulfide bonds uh, stabilizing its structure. Um, and in fact, it interestingly enough, is uh, it has a pH optimum near neutral, but slightly less than neutral, around, around 6 in fact. And when it goes to town, boy, does it break down RNA. The mechanism of the ribonuclease enzyme is very, very similar to that of alkaline hydrolysis. That is to say that once again, the proton is going to be abstracted from the 2 prime hydroxyl, generating that potent nucleophile that's going to attack the phosphorus atom of the 3 prime phosphate. However, what's going to be very different is at the heart of the RNAase enzyme, there isn't any base to do the abstracting of that 2 prime proton. So instead, and I think it will surprise you little to know this, there is a histidine residue that is once again up to its own, its old proton tricks. It's going to do the abstracting of that two prime proton from the hydroxyl, generating that strong nucleophile that's going to go ahead and do the attacking of the phosphorus atom. Now the one thing that's going to be very different here is that although we will see the formation of that um, six click intermediate, we will not see the formation of a mixed 2 prime and 3 prime product. Instead, we will only see the formation of the 3 prime nucleoside monophosphate because, in fact, the enzyme allows for the formation of only that single product. And in terms of cleavage, this enzyme is actually unique to specific cleavage sites. In fact, um, it cleaves to the right of pyrimidine residues. Now, if we recall, um, the purines are A and G, right? Um, you remember the good old antage, all good girls are pure, right? Um, yeah, um, A and G are our purines, right? So it's going to cleave to the right of pyrimidines, so the other nucleotides, not these two, it will cleave to the right of those. So the question is, draw the cleavage products of the following strand if it were hydrolyzed by the enzyme RNAase. Now there's two things we have to think about, right? First, we have to think about and find the pyrimidines, so not A or G, but there's U, not A or G, but there's C, okay? So it's going to cleave to the right of U and C um, because they are our pyrimidines, but that's only part of the help. We also have to consider that it cleaves the 5 prime phosphoester linkage. That means that the phosphate group is going to accompany the more 5 prime nucleotide. That is, in this case, it's going to go along with the U, right? Go back to your earlier drawing if this still seems confusing. It's a UP product here, a CP product here. So our cleavage products will be those, PA, PG, PUP, right? And then AP, CP. And then we'll have GPU, right? So those are going to be our cleavage products upon recognition by ribonuclease A. And let's go ahead and uh, mention here, and we already stated it earlier, but the cleavage mechanism certainly does take advantage of the open 2 prime hydroxyl. Very much so. Hey, so that's how RNAase goes to town in breaking down RNA. We're going to turn our attention now to a unique subclass of endonucleases. Um, these are termed restriction endonucleases. And if you remember, the endonucleases are the type of nuclease that cleave within the middle of a sequence. And in fact, a restriction endonuclease has a unique sequence that it acts upon and cleaves 
within the molecule of DNA. So it is unique to DNA and it does recognize specific DNA sequences and when it does it cuts at both strands. Now generally as we're going to see um, this will generally cut at both strands of DNA in a slightly offset location leaving a, a very small region of single-stranded DNA on both of the fragments and we'll talk about that very momentarily and how those are called sticky ends. Um, so it produces fragments of DNA that can quickly be degraded by exonucleases. Remember those are the nucleases that chew from either the 5' prime or the 3' prime end. Now, the name restriction endonuclease actually comes from the fact that bacteria produce these to restrict the expression of foreign viral DNA. So they actually make these to degrade viral DNA or phage DNA, remembering that a phage is just a virus that attacks a bacterium. So it's actually a defense strategy. They make these endonucleases so that they can get rid of, um, hopefully, and degrade um, foreign phage DNA before that phage invades and takes over the cell. Now, the question then comes up, well, if bacteria make these endonucleases uh, specifically to degrade certain types of DNA from a phage, how do they protect their own DNA? How do they keep their own DNA from getting acted upon by these endonucleases?